Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Ann Remolador, and I'm the Assistant Director for the Northeast Recycling Council, um, also known as NERC. And NERC is partnering with NUMOA uh, to bring you this webinar today to talk about anaerobic digestion at farms. Everyone will be put on mute for the duration of the webinar. We ask that you send your questions at any time um, by posting them in the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. We will address all questions during the last 30 minutes of this webinar. We will be recording the webinar and um, we'll be posting both the recording and the presentations on NERC's and NUMOA's website. Um, our first presenter today is Vanessa McKinney program manager of EPA's AgStar program, where she works with U.S. livestock, biogas, and government stakeholders to advance the deployment of digesters and biogas systems. She has over a decade of experience in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and air emissions, regulation, and policy. Terry, if you could please um, sh share the screen with Vanessa. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Vanessa McKinney. I am the program manager for EPA's AgStar program. I'm hoping you can see my first slide. Yes. At this point, see. okay, great. Uh, thanks again to NERC and NAMOA for reaching out to AgStar. I'm happy to be able to share with you our new anaerobic digester product development handbook. Um, I'll be doing a brief overview of our AgStar program. Um, what the product development handbook is and, and what you can expect to get out of it, as well as some additional resources that our AgStar program offered. So um, AgStar is a partnership program that began in the early 90s. Um, we have a goal to reduce methane emissions from on-farm manure management. Um, we are a voluntary program. We have no regulatory oversight and therefore we direct our efforts towards education, outreach, assisting and growing the number of anaerobic digester projects in the United States. Um, we do this through a couple of direct outreach um, efforts. Um, we are a collaborative program with the United States Department of Agriculture to review a, a number of grant programs that they have regarding anaerobic digestion, um, primarily through the REAP program, Rural Energy for America program. And um, <clears throat> we work with them to evaluate new digester projects that are being developed um, all across the United States. So first we work to promote research in anaerobic digestion, um, letting stakeholders from government, nonprofits, farms, project developers, um, understand and realize what the economic and environmental benefits are to utilizing anaerobic digestion as a manure management technique. Um, like I said, we're a voluntary program. We also have um, AgStar partners, which are nonprofits, um, state and local government, and university stakeholders, primarily from um, our land grant universities that engage with cooperative extensions across the country to share the information um, about those benefits that anaerobic digestion offers. And then we also collect a lot of information on the projects that are going on across the United States with anaerobic digestion um, and share that information openly to hopefully enable and grow um, the implementation of on-farm anaerobic digester projects uh, across the United States. Uh, so the primary meat of my presentation is about our brand new anaerobic digester handbook. Um, this document was um, published earlier this spring, and it's a comprehensive compilation of the latest knowledge and in industry best practices 
for developing and implementing anaerobic digester system. Uh, the document is over 100 pages of information. Um, it's farm focused, but it's certainly applicable for a number of stakeholders and local governments. I, I've seen from um, the uh, attendees list that was shared with us that we have a number of um, state and local government representatives that are on the line today that are really interested in knowing how these systems work. Um, so, you know, this document is for you as well. Um, and our goal is to ensure that anaerobic digester projects that are developed really have a sound framework for long-term project success. Um, so, like I said, this is a quite a long document, you know, over 100 uh, pages of information and 11 chapters um, focusing on, on directed topics. Um, I've reviewed a few questions that folks had a couple um, had a head of, head of the call, and um, many folks asked about um, food waste digestion issues. Um, and I can assure you that um, this topic is touched on on many areas in the document, um, primarily in the digester feedstock uh, category chapter. Um, and it, it really is a lovely document that provides information and links to different sections in the document. Um, it's um, a PDF file that will help you explore certain topics that you're interested in um, within the document itself. Um, but then also list to outside sources for you know, more in-depth information. Um, briefly, we did have a in-depth webinar on the Project Development Handbook back on May 27th. Um, so I would invite you to visit our website and, and take a deep dive into that webinar. It's in the process of being posted to epa.gov slash agstar. Um, this very day, uh, so that should be live for you. Um, you can also um, interact with the Agstar program and ask any questions that you might have um, on this document or other items um, by visiting our website. So um, our project development handbook starts off with what we like to call our 10 key steps to digester success. And number one is you would you need to have a plan um, for your success. What is it that you want out of your project? What are your goals? What are some risks in the area? And um, develop a baseline inventory for farm or food waste in your area that maybe you were interested in co-digestion. Um, what do you want out of the project? Um, are you interested in reducing your electric bill? Do you want to produce renewable natural gas? These are all sort of piecewise steps that you can take in step one to ensure that your AD project meets a range of needs for you. Um, since anaerobic digester projects have very complex needs, they're, they're mechanical systems, they're chemical systems, they're biological systems, it's great to have a good baseline inventory of what you want from your project and why so that you can move forward and work with developing an effective plan moving forward. Uh, step two is to recruit an experienced and objective implementation team. Um, like I mentioned, these projects are very uh, integrated with lots of different needs depending on what you do on your farm, what kind of waste maybe you are taking in for co-digestion, and all parts and pieces of your anaerobic digester have to work together seamlessly and handling the demands of your facility. Um, there are hundreds of example projects across the United States that we have in our AgStar project database. Um, so it's really important to see the range of projects that are being carried out in the US and compare those projects that are in existence, how they're operating, and how maybe perhaps they are applicable to your facility so that you can um, 
have a very clear vision and, and goals moving forward um, for success. Third, we want to follow a sustainable business model. Your project should not only be cost effective, but it should meet financial goals. Um, there are a number of economic factors, which include um, defining your project costs, expenses, revenue, income, and liability. Um, your personal goals for the project's liquidity and profitability um, are, are dependent upon a number of factors. Um, your business model should consider involving outside partners, um, perhaps utilizing third-party investors, um, which we'll be hearing from our, um, our other speakers later on the call after me today um, that embody these types of new partnerships that are emerging in the anaerobic digester um, marketplace. So step four. We want to be sure that we secure a suitable feedstock supply and test it for its biomethane potential. Now, um, some facilities you, you will see if you look at our Agastar project database um, are standalone farm manure only um, digesters. Some of these digesters um, elect to take in perhaps food waste or ag waste from other growing operations nearby, maybe it's a corn stock, um, in addition to local food waste. Um, those are all steps that you need to ensure that you're receiving a suitable feedstock and consistent feedstock supply and making sure that any material that comes onto your farm meets um, standards so as to not upset your, your digester and all of the activities that are taking place within that digester. Um, ensuring that your mechanical processes, chemical processes, and biological processes are not um, taken offline with an errant batch of, of food waste that is perhaps um, contaminated in some fashion. Um, the project development handbook goes into uh, some great detail about feedstock supply and the typical biomethane potential of certain feedstocks. Um, anaerobic digesters using manure, particularly cattle manure, they have a very baseline biomethane potential, not off the charts, but it is a continuous and steady supply that provides a, a consistent material from which to grow and maybe accept other items if you choose to do so. Um, but the good thing about um, particularly cattle manure is that it's rich in um, methanogens that can create um, biogas. And it's, it's helpful to continuously renew those bacteria in your system with um, manure waste. So for five, um, you want to ensure that you use the most appropriate technology to, to match what feedstocks are using and what your output goals are for digesting. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you might be interested in reducing your energy costs or perhaps reducing um, renewable natural gas, which is interchangeable for natural gas. And in some instances, products are injecting um, renewable natural gas directly into uh, our natural gas pipeline. And this can be used for vehicle fuel or heat processes, um, just like you would for regular natural gas. Um, biogas can also be produced into a number of plastics. Um, and if you're interested in producing perhaps fertilizer or utilizing bedding, um, or compressing products and so for some building materials. Um, there are a number of uh, technical items, screw presses that will separate undigested um, fibrous material, or indigestible fiber, um, from a liquid fertilizer product. And these items can be compartmentalized and, and sold as commercial products thereby generating revenue, additional revenue for your farm. 
So for step six and seven, um, you, as much as you want to ensure a steady stream of feedstock, be it manure or co-digested food waste coming into your project, from step four, you want to ensure um, that if your intention is to produce sellable products from biogas and digestate, that you have offtake agreements in place to ensure those products make it to market. Whether it's R&D or electricity, a utility has to be aware of your project scope capabilities and be able to accept the energy that you will produce. If you are looking to produce consumable products from the AD unit digestate, you are also um, ensuring that those secondary or finished products make it into the hands that need it on a continuous basis. Um, anaerobic digester units are continually operating. Um, so you want to be ensured, um, make sure that those products make it off the farm facility and therefore maximize your revenue stream. Step eight, um, you want to identify the wide range of uh, benefits that your intended project produces. Digesters have a number of tangible and intangible benefits. Um, an example perhaps is odor control. Um, other folks um, that had um, asked questions ahead of the call um, were interested in greenhouse gas emissions, air and water quality benefits, um, nutrient management benefits. Um, again, these are all explored more in depth in the project development handbook. Um, and these are all great um, items that will help you prepare um, for the next step in your project, which is um, conducting community outreach and education. Um, number nine, uh, education and outreach is often something that maybe perhaps falls by the wayside, um, but it's very important that you plan, research, and devote project funds um, to this part of scoping your anaerobic digester. Um, community buy-in can make or break a plan. Um, so you want to be ensured, you want to ensure that you're communicating the benefits of your project and engage your community. Um, this is a particular area that we discussed in our May 27th webinar on the project development handbook, which will be posted um, to AgStar's website um, very soon. Um, finally, our key step is um, you want to be sure to continually optimize your operations and maintenance protocol. Um, excuse me. At the beginning of the call, um, I mentioned how this document isn't just for government um, folks or farmers um, that are interested in developing the project. This document is also very useful for folks who perhaps already have an operating anaerobic digester and want to ensure that they're checking all the boxes and, and making sure that their systems, um, excuse me, are optimized and um, doing and, and maximizing revenue to the best of their abilities. Um, like I mentioned, anaerobic digester systems are very complex. They're almost like living systems. There's mechanical, biological, and chemical processes that you always need to ensure are optimized and, and, and running so that you minimize downtime um, for maintenance and um, ensure that you're continuously generating revenue from inputs under the farm and offtake um, from the products that the unit produces. Uh, so, I'd like to invite everyone to uh, visit our website. Like I've mentioned a couple of times during my presentation, we have lots of great resources. The webinar is being posted today that goes more in depth into certain topics of the Project Development Handbook. We also um, have a number of in-depth project profiles, which are um, really case studies and um, our, our farm that we're featuring later on in this presentation, Barway Farm, um, we have a project profile of their operations and how they um, utilize their anaerobic digestion system. Um, for folks that are 
maybe perhaps more interested in the you know, chemical and biological processes and, and things that you need to engage in to keep anaerobic digester projects operating optimally, we have um, need an operator and an AD ombudsman um, case study section on our website. So you can get to learn and understand how these systems operate and what's involved in that. And I'd like to invite everyone to um, subscribe to our lister. Um, we'll be uh, actually providing a message through our lister, uh, I think next week, where we'll be sharing some more information about additional training, webinars, and, and reports that um, not only the AgSTAR program at EPA uh, has, has worked on, but our sister programs in our landfill methane outreach program, where we talk about um, RNG specifically, the renewable natural gas that can be used um, interchangeably with natural gas and the incentives that are available um, uh, for that particular end use product. Um, we also are going to be putting out later this year an anaerobic digester operator guidebook, um, which really goes in depth into the chemical, mechanical, and biological processes that are happening within an anaerobic digester unit and how you continue to optimize those systems as an operator. So with that, I'll end there. Um, please visit our website, uh, epa.gov slash agstar. Um, you feel free to reach out to me directly, my email there. Um, we also have a question section on our website. So feel free to ask questions now in the chat box or um, at any point in the future um, by reaching out to contact us. So with that, I will turn it back over to Nurk and Amoa. Thanks. Thank you, Vanessa. Our next speaker, that was a wonderful overview of the handbook. A lot of questions are coming in. Um, we will get to them uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, the question that's come up um, that we've talked about already, but I want to say it is again that the webinar recording and presentations will be available on NERC's and NUMOA's website after the webinar. Um, I'll be posting those presentations today and the recording will come after. Um, next, we have Peter Melnick. Peter is the owner of Barway Farm in Deerfield, Mass. And Peter will be talking about his experience with um, having a, an anaerobic digester on his farm. Peter, I would, your presentation is up. Let me just make sure that you and Terry, I am not seeing, if you can unmute Peter. Peter's unmuted. You need to start the slideshow, Marianne? Yes, I am working on that. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready? Yes, are we up, Marianne? Yes, Peter, we are. Okay. Um, well, thank you um, for inviting me to speak today. Um, wonderful presentation by Vanessa. Um, if I had had that 100-page handbook in 2010, I probably could have saved about three years of my life. Um, so I just want to, uh, I'm going to keep my presentation um, relatively short and almost make it like a story to tell you basically the story of um, how I went about putting an anaerobic digester on my farm. Uh, it's about a 10 year story in about 15 minutes. So I will try to get the key points in. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Marianne? Yes. I am working on that. Yeah. Okay. So um, a little bit about Barway Farm. We are in Deerfield, Massachusetts, which is about 90 miles um, due west of the city of Boston, which later on I will tell you was an important factor. Um, we're located in the Connecticut River Valley, which has fortunately some of the most fertile soils in the world. Um, we milk 300 cows. And um, we also grow 
um, butternut squash for wholesale. We grow forages, uh, corn and hay for other local dairy farms. And we also this year started growing, um, or two years ago, growing um, hemp for CBD oil. Um, this year we're going to have 50 acres. Um, and uh, we started operating our digester in 2016. Uh, this picture is of my father, myself, and my son, uh, the third, fourth, and fifth generations. Uh, our farm celebrated its 100th year last year. How does a farm last a hundred years? Um, sometimes I ask myself that when I have to get up real early in the morning. Um, but I think one of the most important pieces of advice is that I've received over the years that has helped our farm carry on um, is my grandfather told me that you need to use all the assets that you have. And when I came back to the farm in the 90s, um, I looked at what we were doing. And one thing became very obvious to me is that we were underutilizing our manure. There had to be more value in it. Um, at the time, there was very few digesters. Um, I had seen one in Vermont that was running. Um, it was very primitive. It was not really anything that I was interested in. But in 2010, a developer came um to my farm and he reached out to lots of dairy farms in massachusetts and he had this great idea that we could all collaboratively form uh, a co-op and run digesters on our farm and take food waste from the city of boston and uh, i was really excited about it um, we ended up forming a company called a green energy and we actually built a farm uh, dig on-farm digester, uh, 150 um, kilowatt system uh, in Rutland, Mass. And our hopes was to build five of them. Um, we started in on the second one, and it became very obvious to many of us that um, to continue building the project out, that we were going to all have to basically mortgage our farms very heavily and the banks were not willing to um, fund these projects without lots of farm collateral. So our group kind of dissipated, um, which was kind of, a, it was a blessing and a curse, I guess. Um, and, but I kept my pathway to building the digesters going forward and, um, after our company um, stopped, it was interesting, right after our company um, sort of disbanded, a co-op disbanded, I got about five phone calls from different manufacturers, technology providers of digesters saying that um, they would love to work with me. Uh, I ended up doing a lot of vetting, and I think that's a key thing to remember. Uh, that the um, you really have to, when you get into this, whether you're a community-based digester or farm-based, that um, doing your homework on who you're going to pick as a provide, technology provider and also possibly a management partner, you really need to do your homework because it is a 20 or 30 year investment. And once it's on your on your site, it's there for the long haul. Um, so anyways, I chose a company, a Canadian-based company, and um, we basically got a grant to, um, to keep going forward, and the grant was going to pay for the permitting. The, my partners just kept saying to me, um, the closer we get this to being shovel ready, the cl closer we will be to building, um, building the digester. And uh, they were, they were um, that was very good advice because as we went through the process, um, we had lots of different um, opportunities. We met with many investors. Um, all different varieties, and everybody sort of 
wanted different things out of the project. And I think what I had to do um, was become comfortable with what I wanted to get out of the methane digester on my farm. Um, and that process um, took a little while to realize. I realized from the beginning, and I think this is really important, that for a 300 cow dairy farm to try to capitalize a one, two, three, six, eight, ten million dollar project um, is almost impossible uh, unless your farm has um, a, a large cash holding um, that most farms don't have. So I really wasn't willing to basically bet the farm, so to speak, on methane digestion, uh, especially with its track record. So I really had to come to the realization that I wasn't necessarily going to own the digester by myself. And in our co-op model, I had kind of gotten used to that. Um, but I also didn't like the model, not to say that it's not for other people, of getting a um, venture capitalist or somebody who really just wants to um, get the, I call it, get the tax break um, by putting a large chunk of money in the beginning and then basically probably bailing on the project in years three to seven. Um, and then basically I would have to go out and remortgage the digester for another eight years, eight to 10 years, which would put me somewhere at about 15 years, 10 to 15 years before I owned the digester and was getting all the benefits myself. So what happened um, is that we, I was designing a 500 kilowatt um, system and the permitting was um, daunting to say the least. There was not all the guidance that there is now. The state of Massachusetts had only done one other digester at the time. Um, they were very proactive to, to AD, but um, they um, were very inexperienced. So we all worked together, but it definitely took a lot of twisting, turning, a lot of time. Um, sometimes there were some roadblocks that seemed insurmountable, but we kept pushing through. Um, having a good partner who is um, adept in the permitting process is very, very important. I worked with CH4 out of Canada, and they had some wonderful staff who um, spent a lot, lot more time on it than myself as a farmer um, could have. Uh, unless I decided not to milk cows every day, uh, I don't think I could have done it on my own um, without hurting my other business. So anyways, we, um, we got the project just about ready to go. Um, the interconnection with the um, power company is a very, very lengthy and expensive uh, and challenging part of the project. Um, we got just about there and at the same time, um, as we were about ready to, uh, you know, we really were ready to, to start building once we got some funding, um, my old developer of A-Green Energy had teamed up with um, Vanguard Renewables. And Vanguard came forward and basically um, kind of talked about a unique relationship where um, I would be a part owner of the digester, but I would get lots of um, immediate uh, benefits that were off takes. Um, and I guess I kind of equated, I tell people that I changed my focus of looking at a digester as paying off a digester in 10 to 15 years and then having this real cash cow, pardon the pun, um, in my backyard that was paid for and was really making me a lot of money, call that the home run scenario, to being a partner with somebody else, Vanguard in this case, and hitting lots of singles 
um, all every day, but still scoring runs and still benefiting my farm, making my farm more environmentally sustainable, but also very much so financially sustainable. And so basically the agreement that we worked out in a nutshell is that I um, rent the facility from, uh, I rent the real estate, two acres, two, we can change the slide so you can see the actual digester, Marianne. So there's a picture of the facility and a dairy barn. It was just a kind of a mowed area of grass. Um, we went and uh, we rent the two acres to Vanguard Renewable. We get a rent check um, and they pay their share of the real estate taxes that increased. And then I get um, basically um, a 50% reduction in my electricity bill. I get a I get bedding from the separated solids that come off the digestate. And that saved uh, me about $2,000 a month in sawdust that I was using. I get all the digestate that I need for my 600 acres of land. And I was at a 300 cow farm, um, farming over 600 acres. I was a little bit um, nutrient um, deficient. So I was buying commercial fertilizer. Now I'm uh, using solely digestate and it is working phenomenal and we're striking we do have to export a little bit of nutrients to some local vegetable farms but the farm is really finding a nice balance nutrient balance of outtake from the digester intake from the acres that we're growing and we've seen a 20 percent yield increase um, and had a phenomenal hemp crop last year um, using the digestate so we're really happy with that part of it. Um, we're hoping to utilize the heat. We have a three, 3 million BTUs of extra heat the digester makes every day. And we're hoping to capitalize on that in the future by, by building a greenhouse and also heating the barn in my house. And we have lots of other benefits. Uh, such as the odor reduction. I would say that my neighbors could verify this, but I would say odor reduction is probably about 90%. Um, and that has been a really um, great side benefit of this whole project. Um, I think the key thing is, is that um, I'm going to hand this over soon to John, but uh, Putting, deciding to put a digester on your farm, like I said, is a major decision. Um, and it's a 20 or 30 year one. And really doing your homework, taking your time, seeing if the digester fits your farm. Um, we take food waste from Boston. Um, without that food waste, um, my project would not be feasible with 300 cows and manure only. Um, it would not pay for itself. And um, I really stuck, um, I did not want any source separated organics happening on my farm. All the, you, uh, could you move the slide forward, please? Uh, one more. So all the food waste comes in on trucks like this, all enclosed, some dump trailers um, as well, but there's no garbage anywhere in our facility our site, um, they come in, they hook up hoses, offload, very clean, uh, odorless as much as possible. Um, we try to be really good neighbors. We try to keep our facility in tip top shape. And um, Vanguard has the same, shares the same um, outlook as we do. I, I will hand this over to John now, but I will say one thing that is really, really key to this and it continues to be even as the project goes on um, and will for the next 25 years is that finding a provider, I mean a management firm that um, understands that, that that just isn't there to make money but understands that the farm um, has to benefit as well is really important. Um, and uh, 
John's been a man of his word. Um, things can be difficult at times. We've had our share of challenges. I don't want to paint the rosy picture. I can tell you some stories um, about things that we struggled with in the beginning, but um, my commitment and John's commitment to doing, um, you know, to making this project work uh, and his commitment to making sure that the farm benefits really has, I think, um, shown me that when you um, find the right people and you pick the right technology um, and the right kind of digester for your operation, that it really can be a success story. So with that, I will hand it over to John. Thank you, Peter. It's so good to hear uh, a farmer's perspective on this topic and your example is just a wonderful one. Um, I just, uh, uh, Terry, if you could share the screen with John. Sounds good. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Great. So um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Hanselman. Um, I'm partners with uh, Peter Melnick and a, a series of other farmers uh, pursuing anaerobic digestion uh, in network farms across the United States. Um, I, I agree with Peter. I, I wish um, Vanessa's handbook had been out uh, seven or eight years ago when we started this adventure. Uh, I think it would have made our lives significantly easier. Um, but I'd love to go through today and just talk about um, our process, um, how we, we I think, tried to find and follow some of those uh, 10 keys to success and the, the times that it worked and the times that it didn't, um, and hopefully give some insights in terms of um, how to make uh, farm-based anaerobic digestion uh, work and how to, how to actually feel the wonderful beneficial impacts um, that Peter was talking about. Uh, in other farms around the U.S., um, I'm often asked and 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 constantly teased uh, by my my kids about how did a, a nice renewable energy guy get so involved in cow manure and food waste. Um, I, I think the the answer was that that probably about 10 years ago, I recognized that there are so many issues. Um, around the food supply chain and that understanding those, those impacts uh, of the food supply chain are, can be uh, either entirely detrimental to our, our health and our environment um, or something that becomes really beneficial. Um, I think the pandemic has really crystallized so many aspects of, that, of those flaws um, and has really brought it you know, to the forefront in terms of, of the challenge to, to both um, the agriculture community and the the food manufacturing and retail community as to how to to make a better model um, and that that for us was was really obvious um, 10 years ago um, and we really wanted to see if there was a way that we could change the way that we embraced um, the supply chain um, one of the things that was was remarkable as we started to look at it is the just the vast quantity of food waste um, and agricultural waste that is resident um, in our society. And again, depending upon which study you look at, something like 30% of all uh, harvested and manufactured food ends up in incinerators and landfills. Um, if you look inside a landfill, something like 40% of that, um, of the volume of that landfill is, is a comprised of organic materials. Um, that material ending up in landfill or incinerator is going to end up, you know, really being converted into harmful greenhouse gases uh, and or noxious liquids that then end up degrading our rivers and streams. And, and unfortunately, that's, that's true across most of the United States. So we really, the reason we started the company was we recognized that that didn't need to be the case. Uh, we had spent time looking uh, in Europe and in Germany and Denmark and the UK at how they had been handling food waste um, for the past decade um, prior to our starting. And we recognized that, that with some simple behavioral change, um, 
not unlike the change where, where as Americans, we learn to uh, recycle and bundle and, and reprocess cardboard. Um, that same evolution could happen uh, in the food waste and in the food supply chain. Um, so we jumped in um, and decided we'd try to figure out if we could crack the code. Um, when we looked at what had happened in the United States with anaerobic digestion, we were, we were really surprised because it is so successful and so widespread um, in Europe. And we looked around in the US and, and anaerobic digestion really was, was almost a dirty word. Um, when you talk to farmers, uh, often uh, they had had a, an experience with anaerobic digestion or one of their um, family members in, in the agriculture industry had had um, some experience and, and most of them had a very negative impression. Uh, most farmers felt like they had been kind of sold a bill of goods uh, and were told that the digesters ran themselves and um, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, digesters are dynamic, uh, as, as Peter uh, indicated a minute ago. Uh, they, are, they are unique um, machines that basically have to interact in the intersection between um, biology and chemistry. Um, and that is, is an interesting place to live. Um, and so we decided out to, to try and see if we could get a, a better model for the US. Um, we, when we wrote our original business plan, I think we got more of it wrong than we got right. Uh, again, Vanessa would have loved to have that handbook. Um, but the two things that we really got right, first was citing digesters on farms um, creates an, an amazing synergy um, between the farm operations, um, if done correctly, uh, and the, the, the waste uh, recycling. Um, the second notion is really that single digesters um, are, are quite dangerous um, in there. If you're just having one by its own right, um, you really need to take them and network them and take multiple farms in a, in a region and link them to build a redundant and resilient network um, so that you have that kind of dependency and, and understanding of what we're doing. Um, one of the other things that not only the farm community have issues with, with um, the anaerobic digestion performance, but waste haulers and food manufacturers also had a very negative sense that, that digesters weren't reliable because usually it was a single hauler being connected to a single farm and, and the variability, uh, the ups and downs of those digesters um, were really too hard for, for folks who ran um, tankers every day and who needed to be able to know that they were having a reliable destination. Um, they just couldn't do it. Um, so we, uh, came up with kind of the third part of that, um, the, the last one of our really important messages, and I think this resonates with, with what Vanessa said, is we also looked at um, professionally managing the systems and understanding that um, the farmers could manage the digesters, um, but it just becomes now another task in an already really complicated and long day for the farmer. And so rather than asking them to take on that responsibility um, we took on the responsibility to, to hire um, the folks that we need, um, the chemists, the biologists, um, the mechanics uh, and operators um, to really be able to run these in a professional kind of networked manner. Um, as our business has evolved, uh, we really uh, have two different flavors of digesters that we see in the marketplace. Um, the, the first is uh, the, like a digester that we did with Peter, which is a, a co-digestion system where we're taking animal manure and food waste um, in different proportions. And, and you can do lots of different formulas and recipes. Um, our kind of ideal is a 30% animal manure and 70% food waste, but we, we run um, almost every mix that you could imagine uh, back and forth on that. Um, those systems are usually best run uh, on a kind of 200 to, to 2,500 milking head operation. Um, so smaller family farms kind of dealing with um, the digestate is easier in that respect and being able to know that, that we've got a, a nice symbiotic relationship with, with the farm when we're creating that high energy um, gas. Uh, when we go to manure only digesters, which have become exceedingly popular in the last two years with California's uh, evolution of their low carbon fuel standard. Uh, manure only digesters are, are now popping up 
around the states. Um, those, because of the cost of the upgrading uh, equipment, um, you, I think, as Marianne was saying earlier on, animal um, manure only digesters have have much lower output. Um, and actually, maybe Vanessa had been saying, sorry. Um, so you need to aggregate a whole lot more manure to create um, the, the renewable natural gas, uh, but to also to be able to offset the very, very expensive cost of the gas upgraders, which is the, the system that clean the gas to the quality standard that allows you to import it into the, the natural gas pipeline, um, the, you need to have a lot more, more cows resident there. Um, so. We actually, uh, in 2019, um, partnered up with, with the good folks at Dominion Energy um, to go out and build uh, a lot of those systems across the U.S. Um, what's amazing to us and, and where we, we saw the, the great opportunity is, is understanding that there, there are lots of places that food waste can go, but, but really compost and anaerobic digestion are, are the two places, and I'm sorry, let me roll back. The first and foremost uh, destination for all food waste, uh, if it is possible, is for human or animal consumption. So that's the place where I think EPA has said, and, and we, we fully agree, um, your greatest benefit is, is being able to get the food back to folks um, who might be in a, in a food insecurity um, standpoint or, or are looking for that, those, um, those nutrients and proteins back in the community. Um, if, the, if that food can't be utilized that way. So it becomes unusable because of the condition of the food, the age of the food, um, or how it was processed. Um, we believe the place it really needs to end up is, is compost and anaerobic digester. We work very, very closely with uh, our partners in the compost community. Um, there are, are different types of food waste, there are different types of contaminants that, that compost is better at, at handling. Um, there is more than enough food waste resident in every community to fully fill um, fleets of anaerobic digesters, um, create compost facilities, and get food back into the, the hands of people in need. Um, that's not the challenge. Um, the challenge is, I think, going back to uh, Vanessa's number nine, is really the educational component um, and letting people understand in the community early and often that, that this is a possibility. Um, food waste, I think, for most folks, when I think one of the things that, that Peter and I both comment on is uh, we've never had a single person. We've given hundreds, maybe thousands of tours over the last eight years um, on our digesters. And I can honestly say I've never had a single person who said, eh, we're, we're not that interested. Um, what we hear every single time is people saying, wow, I had no idea we could do that. I had no idea I could take my food waste and make renewable energy. Um, and so for us, really getting that message out is a, is a big part of it. Um, we work very closely with our regulatory um, communities, partners. Um, in many places we go to, um, we're the first digesters or the first large scale digesters that they've seen. And so letting them understand on the regulatory side, you know, what to expect, how the process runs, um, super important, uh, but equally important is starting to educate Americans as to the closed loop nature of, of food waste recycling. Um, and I think that's that's something that that is more and more important and more and more um, meaningful these days uh, as everyone's kind of looking at food and trying to figure out um, where it comes from to create transparency and how it's produced and transparency in how it is uh, disposed of. Um, and I think food recycling uh, can be applied to virtually any food that's in the marketplace. Um, you do have to, as, as we have, kind of build a vertically integrated model where you can take food out of packaging, you can take food and remove it from contaminants, other contaminants, and get it to the farms. Uh, but if you can do that, this loop is so incredibly compelling uh, and um, powerful. Um, what, we, what we see over and over again is um, food is, is produced uh, in the agricultural industry, it's sent to the manufacturing industry. There is there is waste at the farm. So for us, in working with the dairy community, you're you're seeing all that manure, which has been a, a real odor problem for folks. There may be some nutrient issues uh, around that uh, in terms of phosphorus and nitrogen getting back into the the watershed. Um, that that can all go into the digester. 
um, we can and, and are currently in Vermont actually tuning the digestate um, to, to look and remove phosphorus and be able to have a better uh, and actually upgrade the quality of the watershed. Uh, when it goes off to the manufacturer, you, what you're seeing there is um, there's lots of process waste, there's expired product, um, there's wash water. All of that was getting dumped down into the drains uh, and ending up in wastewater treatment plants, uh, where it's a challenge for the wastewater treatment plant. It gets cross-contaminated with, with human waste um, and ends up having to either be land applied uh, or discharged into the into the watershed. Um, neither of those, I think, are have the, the power of what we can do with it if we can keep it on the farm. Um, we take that manufacturer's waste, we take that back to the farm, we give them, uh, we create the um, energy from it, uh, we send that energy back to the manufacturer, we can send it to the consumer, um, either uh, through retail locations or um, in households, as we're doing, we've, uh, we have a new project coming up in Vermont where um, the local utility, Vermont Gas Services, has created an opt-in program where any one of their customers can actually choose to have between five and 100% of their energy that's delivered to their home um, from renewable natural gas. Uh, and to us, that is kind of a, a beacon of hope in terms of a new model for the natural gas system and a way to decarbonize um, the natural gas loop without having um, to invest uh, millions of dollars and take years and years of, of, of work. Um, this is something that can happen uh, immediately and have really compelling impact on um, the, the entire carbon cycle. Again, Peter talked about um, how we work and just a, a brief sense of, of what we do. Um, so we take food waste and cow manure and we bring it onto the farm. Uh, we have a, a extremely uh, evolved system now, it's taken us a while, um, to get the food into our, our digestion tanks. Um, get it to the point where, and, and make sure that there is no odor component to it, that we don't have a negative impact on the neighbors, but actually a very positive impact because we're also taking 100% of the manure from Peter's farm and get it into those, those digester vessels. Um, when we are, after we've processed it for about 30 days, so we cook it up, um, stir it up, uh, keep it blended and mixed, and try and um, make a very happy bug population. So we have the methanogens that we were talking about earlier, that Vanessa was talking about. Uh, we spend a lot of time understanding our methanogens um, and making sure that they're happy and hungry. Uh, we feed them with the food waste and uh, they are resident within the manure. Uh, we don't believe in um, genetically modified uh, or structured uh, methanogens that has had some uh, success in Europe, but we see those as being um, a, a real question mark for us and something also, as we understand experience, quite brittle in terms of uh, as things change within the food waste stream, uh, it becomes harder and harder to use those. Uh, when we're done, uh, what we end up is with the wonderful renewable natural gas uh, and or electricity. Um, we, we recover all of the waste heat off of our systems. Uh, we use some of it. The system is entirely self-contained once it is started, once we've created the methanogen population and get the gas production uh, flowing, uh, we, we are a fully self-contained system. Uh, we do then take, we have create extra heat, which we then give back to the farm. Um, as importantly as Peter was talking about earlier, we also have a wonderful uh, fertilizer um, that is we're sending um, to Peter to use as his as his primary and, and any of our farms uh, as their primary fertilization and nutrient um, for their crops. Um, we've seen um, just like if you're eating organic foods yourself, um, you're probably feeling better, looking a little healthier. Uh, when we when we feed this organic fertilizer to crops, uh, I think Peter's number he was saying is about a 20% increase in yield. We've also seen a, a significant and comparable increase in nutritional value of those crops as well. So um, super exciting. Um, for us, I think going back to the process and 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 how to do the right thing uh, with food waste and with farms, uh, we spend an awful lot of time working with our farmers, uh, farm partners, and, and making sure that, that our design and our system fits well within the farm operations. We also really wanna make sure that the farm is going to be a good long-term partner. Um, these assets, these digesters, um, are 20-year minimum, and so uh, it's going to be 
a long relationship and something that you want to make sure everybody is is friends at the beginning, middle, and end. Uh, and uh, so far, I think we've been we've been very successful and and really appreciate um, so much being hosted by our farm partners um, at their facilities. And we spend an inordinate amount of time making sure that we're enhancing farm operations and not um, hurting. Uh, this is, is Peter's uh, digester on his farm. Uh, I won't go through all the specifics, but again, uh, this is the CH4 design that we've actually standardized through most of our platform. Um, it is a, it's a great system. Uh, we spend an inordinate amount of time focused on odor. Uh, one of the things that we saw when we were reviewing the industry way back when and when we started is that the number one reason for that we saw for closing uh, anaerobic digesters and composters was odor. Um, sensitizing neighbors, once they're sensitized to an odor issue, um, it's almost impossible to walk them back. Um, so we preemptively go very, very hard at the odor control side of the business and make sure that that we can have a, a footprint and an odor footprint um, that is not recognizable off the farm. To talk about the timing of what it would take for a farm to, to bring a digester to fruition, um, we have four primary stages before we, we kind of get to, or three before we get to the instruction. Um, first is just coming in and working with um, the farm operation to understand um, how it's going. That, is probably somewhere between 60 to 90 days as we look at um, what the farm is doing, the available cropland. Um, we, we look very hard at the nutrient uh, management program that the farm has put in place to understand what they're doing with their crops currently. Um, we also look at the interconnection status, so how close is electric or um, gas infrastructure if we want to, because our primary goal is to export um, that energy out of the farm, out to the grid, uh, and get into the hands of, of people who can use it. Um, once we've done the due diligence and, and agreed that this is a good fit, uh, we'll go into the design. Um, there, again, looking at um, the sizing of the system, looking at uh, how we can deal with, with the effluent. Um, we also, in the diligence part, I've been looking at all of the, the food waste area and what's happening in the, in the surrounding community. Once we have the design in place, we go into the permitting process. Um, we probably have already reached out um, before we start design to the folks uh, in the regulatory community to just give them a heads up as to what we're doing and, and usually bring them um, to our existing systems, uh, try and show them uh, what we have done historically, and then um, raise that comfort level that that there is a model around which we've, we've, we've now standardized and built our operating system and that's that's very very helpful in getting through the permitting especially when you're going into a community that hasn't had a history with digesters um, there's a lot of, of different messaging around digesters and being able to show working examples that are embraced by the farm and embraced by the neighbors is something that that's absolutely critical um, I didn't put a timing on, on how long that takes because, again, it was very, very much um, state to state dependent. Uh, everyone has got a different, I, I think we're now in our permitting in our seventh state uh, in the US and we have never done it the same way twice. Um, so uh, it's always a little challenging, but but something that, that uh, once we've had our first farm through the process, um, it really starts to pick up speed and then we can bring that project to the farm um, faster and faster each time. Um, once we've gotten through all that process, um, the good news is the construction is, is fairly short. Uh, so it's about eight months for us to, to put it all in place. Um, during the last couple of months, we start charging the system uh, with manure and with food waste. Um, and we're hoping, to, we always hope to produce gas uh, or electricity within 60 to 90 days after construction completion. So um, fairly compact time frame. Um, it might seem long uh, to those who really want to have a digester on their farm today, uh, but in comparison, I guess this is just the, the benefit of having been doing this for a while. Uh, it used to take us a whole lot longer, um, but now I think we have the chance to really be able to move very efficiently through the system. Um, one of the things that 
that Peter talked about a minute ago and, and certainly something that, that has been a big part of our operation um, and our, our methodology is that all these different component pieces that are, are really difficult for the farm to do, the mechanical operations, the feedstock procurement, um, the system biology and chemistry and the energy um, offtake, so the selling of that energy. Um, this is all stuff that we think really is best suited for a professional management team. Um, and we've we've spent an awful lot of time and energy to make sure that we can we can offer all of that to any farm um, and take that responsibility off the table for the farm because especially on the feedstock procurement, we, we found out um, over time as we're doing with food waste, not as much with manure, but that feedstock procurement is really quite challenging um, and requires lots and lots of attention. Um, and it's a consistent updating and upgrading of that of that feedstock flow and making sure that you, you've got a good handle on it. Um, if we do it all John, correctly. John, can I ask you to wrap it up so that yep. we have time for Q&A? I think this is the last slide. Okay, um, great. I guess I won't go through uh, in detail the benefits, but but obviously the thing that we're really looking for is getting farms and communities together um, as a resource for that, that recycling of food waste. And I'll skip the takeaways. I think they've, they've all been pretty evident. Okay, thank you, John. It's um, great to, to have you close the loop on this subject in a sense, because we've heard uh, of resource to help with people who are interested in AD and then the pers Peter's perspective as a farmer and actually having it on his site and then you as the company that manages that facility um, really brings it full circle. I would like to um, now switch to uh, a Q&A period and I would like to introduce Terry of NUMOA. She's the executive director of NUMOA and Terry will be leading our Q&A. Thank you, Marianne. Um, great presentations. This was really interesting. Um, our first question is, I think, for you, Vanessa, for single farm projects, what's the effective minimum size for a digester? Also, maybe John, you can comment on this. Vanessa, you need to mute yourself. Go ahead. Yeah, um, so typically we talk about an ANGSTAR as a standard of um, uh, a minimum of 500 cows. It would be a very small anaerobic digester or 2,000 swine. Um, and then you can get into certain details about or are you accepting off-site waste from perhaps other farms and their manure or um, co-digesting other farm waste. Um, like I mentioned, corn stalks um, as a potential feed, but you know those those tend to be low in in bio biogas potential, um, and then of course food waste, which can can vary considerably in its biogas potential. Um, but you know, like we were talking about um, in my presentation, John referenced as well. Um, these are you know mechanical and chemical processes, so the type of waste that you'll you'll take in. Um, you know, is very dependent on on what system you select and vice versa. And I kind of related to, you know, our our own human digestion system. We have mechanical, chemical, and biological processes that take place. And we get a whole lot of energy from fast oils and greases. Ice cream is really delicious, but if we ate ice cream all the time, it would upset our stomach. Um, it's the same thing. Um, you know, if we, we fed those high biogas potential items to a digester um, on a daily basis as well. So, varies from system to system. Yeah, and I would, I would add in with Vanessa that, that certainly the lower end, the, the smaller farms can, if they're doing co-digestion, you can bring it to smaller and smaller farms. I think we actually are our smallest we have one farm that has about 100 milking head. Um, and there, we're challenged, obviously, uh, to make sure that we get the right mix. 
and that we have the right recipe and that we have enough of the methanogens resident within the system, um, but that it, it can be handled um, through just a, a good management of the of the system. Uh, if you're doing manure only, um, yeah, it really larger, you're you're going to start to talk about a couple thousand head um, as the as the most um, economically viable way to do it. So our next question is, what is the average cost of building a digester? Again, probably Vanessa or John, you want to take this one? I can Fair take enough. it from kind of a, a general perspective. Um, we get asked this question a lot from Agstar, and unfortunately, at the moment, we, we don't really have a good um, data set to, to give an average cost. Um, you know, I think in um, the presentation, the type of digester that um, Farway Farms has and Vanguard operates, um, complete mix systems um, tend to be a bit more expensive. Um, there are some other um, anaerobic digestion systems that can be utilized, uh, such as uh, a plug flow system um, that perhaps are more cost effective um but again it, it depends on on the size of the system the number of animals you might have on your farm and and what kind of additional waste you want to take in um that that will affect um your the cost of your system overall and and vanessa is 100 percent correct um it, it's really very much based on the technology and what you would like to have is the output and also um, how sensitive you are to the system dynamics um, of odor and, and other things. So just making blanket statement of, of cost is pretty tough because it's it's very much like buying a car. Um, you, can, you can buy one for, uh, though these are pretty expensive cars, uh, you, can, you can buy one with uh, not a lot of frills, or you can buy one with a, a lot of bells and whistles. And uh, but I'd say I don't think we've seen a digester that's for 250 milking head that was under three or four million. Um, and that same digester could go for 12 to 15, um, depending upon how much other inputs you're putting in and and how much automated controls and, and odor issues you'd like to deal with. I would, John. I would. I would add, John, that when I was doing my um, research, this was of five year, more than five years ago, but I, I always kind of found out when I did the price shopping, shopping it always seemed to come out um, that uh, 100 kilowatts was a million dollars, a megawatt was $10 million. That baseline number was sort of a, a place to start. Um, you could obviously go less if you didn't have all the bells and whistles, and you can obviously go up from that number. And I would add too um, that I think with the interest that's growing in this field, we may see prices fall. Um, like John alluded to in his presentation, every project that they do, they're they're getting the hang of it. Um, they go to a new new state. There's different permitting things move along faster, um, and, and that's always going to make the installation of these systems more efficient. So as folks jump into this marketplace and there's more providers and people are more experienced with these systems, um, I think that that's the benefit that you'll start to see um, the market, the cost in the market um, start to fall. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a bunch of more questions. Um, this one is maybe a little more complicated. What is being done to control methane fugitive emissions and digest state storage emissions due to incentives that make food waste tipping fees an important revenue source? I have seen uncontrolled releases of methane through relief valves and short HRTs leading to higher residual methane potential for digest state stored in open storage ponds. Who wants to take that it's a really important question. So I think, I think, and this goes back to also the cost structure of the digesters as well, which is um, there are systems that have fugitive emissions, um, and I think there's a history 
uh, of older um, and or cheaper, and I'm sorry to say that, um, digesters that that do have. And, and I think that as an industry, that's unacceptable um, for us. We can't, we can't be making a problem worse. Um, you have to making the, the methane and the greenhouse gas issue much, much better. Um, so we, we focus very, very hard and we actually monitor um, methane emissions on our at, on, at every site, um, test it prior to, to startup, test it um, regularly to make sure that we don't have car, uh, methane emissions um, out of the out of the system, but I, I think it is part of um, the regulatory community and part of the um, industry's standard to actually make sure that we focus on that and make sure that that's not an issue um, for well managed, well built uh, digesters. And I would just add that that's quite simply lost revenue when there's fugitive emissions. If you're looking at methane escaping your system and you're looking to capture that to generate electricity or RNG, um, your, your project is shooting itself in the foot because it's not as efficient as it should be. Um, and so that, that's really unfortunate that that's happening. So here's another question. Does the handbook contain pretreatment and AD type for bioplastics such as corn, soy, cutlery? I don't think the project development handbook gets that specific into uh, that type of waste. Um, but we do talk about pre-processing, um, co-digested waste, and then we link to additional resources um, either within that section or in our um, our resources at the end of the handbook um, to to help you um, get a handle on additional information in that field. So Vanessa, this is another question for you. Can we order a physical handbook? I assume that means like a printed version. Hopefully that's a quick question. Uh, that is unfortunately not an option at, at this point in time. Um, the project development handbook is a um, PDF document and is actually developed to work best in uh, sort of the, the virtual environment for, for lack of a better term. Um, the document links within itself. Um, so one section might broach the topic of co-digestion but then we'll talk about, oh, you know, if you're interested in how you handle co-digested waste, visit you know, this part of the chapter and another section, and we'll automatically take you there and then um, link to other outside resources. So we actually developed the, the project development handbook with the intent of it being best used um, uh, in a, on your computer. Um, and I will say that the document was prior to me even working at EPA had, had um, started to be developed about three years ago. And I think that really shows this is just such a wealth of information um, that we couldn't possibly all print it um, in, a, in one document and keep it up to, with the intention of, of sort of updating um, resources within it. Um, until we move on to, you know, this is our third edition of the handbook. Um, maybe in a few years, as, as the marketplace really grows and adapts, um, we might have, you know, substantial changes to make to it. But we continue to update those links um, within the document, and we intend for it to be, to be living, um, a living document. Thanks, Vanessa. So the next question I'm is for Peter. Peter, do you make money on the waste being brought into the digester? I see that's like the food waste that you're taking in. Are you given a tipping fee or something? So um, I guess the best way to describe that um, is that uh, Deerfield AD LLC is a separate business um, and I'm a part owner of it and Vanguard is a majority stakeholder. Uh, basically, it's run as a separate business, all from the um, tipping fees, from the electricity sales um, into that business at the end of the year, if everything shakes out well. Um, 
I get my my uh, dividend. So uh, not directly, um, but indirectly. Best way to put it. John, did you want to comment on this at all? Sure. Yeah. So we do collect tip fees for for food waste uh, recycling, um, and we're we try and price it so that we are comparable to compost and usually significantly less than going off as solid waste. Um, and that's part of our um, attempt to entice the, the waste hauling community to bring us more and more of, of their food waste and to spend the time to separate the organic stream um, from the just regular trash component of it. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're early days still, but uh, we are, we're definitely trying to be a price conscious uh, alternative for food waste streams. So um, the questions are sort of related. Um, the first one is, have there been disruptions in feedstock flow? And I assume maybe that's under, you know, the conditions of the pandemic. Maybe that's what it's talking about. And what happens when feedstock balance is thrown off? <laughs> um, it's a really, really good question. Uh, so yes, there have been really significant uh, disruptions in the food waste stream. Um, on both sides, both the negative and positive. So there are some feedstocks we're getting a lot more of um, and some that are have just evaporated. Um, again, colleges and universities, which were a, a not insignificant part of the, the food waste stream uh, around our, our regions, um, it just went away. Um, but we started getting lots and lots of process waste um, that from folks being incapable of kind of dealing with the the um, new supply chain issues. Um, so uh, what happens when you get an, a, a, a significant change is we do some very serious scrambling. Um, it's part of the reason why one digester in the marketplace is a very, very dangerous thing. Um, by having multiple digesters, you can try and balance across all of them, the changes. And so as recipes are changing, at each one of the system, we kind of watch the, the chemistries and the biology to understand um, where we can reallocate um, those new and or um, missing components and uh, make sure that, that we kind of keep a, a healthy bug balance. It, it can, that, that all that being said, that's, that's a utopian side of it, if it works perfectly. Um, you can have bad days. Uh, you can lose uh, a lot of your production. Um, you can, you know, we, we have we have good days and bad days. And it, part of the reason that you want to have a redundant multi-site system is so that, that the, a bad day at one farm hopefully is picked up by, by one of the other farms. So our next questions, I'm going to bundle a couple questions here. One is, has anyone seen any competition between AD versus comp a composting, opera composting operation or can they both complement themselves? And what are the primary benefits of anaerobic digesters if a farm already composts their manure? Does it still, quote, pencil out? Any of you want to take those? I, I'd be happy to take it and perhaps John can elaborate. Um, I think there's a really good collaborative uh, environment that's available for anaerobic digestion versus compost. Um, uh, compost uh can take a lot of the brown material that perhaps anaerobic digesters really don't get much value from or perhaps are too um, high in certain um, proteins like ligands that um, anaerobic digesters really can't digest or deal with um, and then AD can take over with perhaps some more of the um, greener waste um, vegetables, um, fruits, those sorts of items, um, and that compost, you know, can get overloaded with too much of that material. So I think they work together hand in hand quite well. Yeah, we we love our compost partners, um, and it's it's a very very close relationship. We we in any new market that we go into. We usually try and find at least uh, one or two composters who will be our initial um, partnering in the development of the food waste marketplace. Um, and and Vanessa hit the nail on the head, which is 
there are things that we really like, um, uh, candidly, the smellier stuff um, that that composting operations probably want to limit the volume of. So as we start to inform the community about the ability to do food waste recycling, there's going to be a greater stream to all of the disposal um, and the recycling uh, outlets. You don't want to overload a composting facility um, so that the neighbors start to get real upset and, and then they have an operational challenge. Um, so uh, it's a great, it's usually a great synergy between the two of us. Um, and our belief in virtually any marketplace that we've seen so far in the United States is that there is more than enough food waste um, for all of us uh, to, to handle. And I would perhaps just um, to touch on the last point of the question about penciling out um, from anaerobic digestion, we have a, a lot of streams coming out of the digester to take advantage of. There's RNG, there's electricity, there's um, bioproducts, bioplastics, there's um, additional um, carbon credits. Um, Peter or, and, and John, well, John had mentioned low carbon fuel standards is something that's very popular and, and was started in California, but many states are starting to um, offer a low carbon fuel standard that will pay um, uh, incentives for renewable natural gas. And, and that makes projects in the anaerobic digestion sphere um, quite lucrative at the moment. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I'm going to bundle um, a few that came in. Um, and so the question relates to sort of impurities and contaminants. Are you taking, so I think this is for John and Peter, are you taking food that came from depackaging? How are you dealing with impurities, particularly plastics and microplastics? And then a sort of related question is, what is an allowable amount of incidental plastics and microplastics that may be present in prepackaged food waste. I assume the digestate will contain the plastics, microplastics, which will be land applied. John, I'll go first. <laughs> um, yes. And you can finish this one up. Uh, as a steward of the land, um, you know, 100 years in my family, I want to leave the farm better. Um, than um, then I took it. And the plastic thing has always been a big issue. Um, it, uh, it's something that's always on our mind. Um, John is responsible for it, but he will tell you that if there is something that is unacceptable, he gets a phone call from my father almost instantly. <laughs> um, we work really hard on it. John has some specific parameters that he sets up with the people bringing it in. Um, um, but it is a challenge. I'll let John carry it on. Yeah, and, and Peter's correct. We, we, we are very aware of the plastic issue and, and want to make sure that it is not a, a concern for the farm and for the soil health. And uh, we have we do reject um, loads that come in that exceed our our standards for for plastic contaminants because depackaging, uh, if it's done quickly uh, or without the right technology, um, can have quite a lot of, of plastic in it. And at that point, we're we are unwilling to accept it. Um, to that end, we actually are building our own depackaging facilities because we've been generally uncomfortable with. The level of plastics that that we see from the the uh, waste hauling community. So, uh, we've taken on ourselves to actually build our own depackaging as part of of our process. So, um, Dan, I don't know how you want to handle this, but we still have a lot of questions, and I'm wondering if um, we can look at those questions after the webinar and see with our speakers if if we could do some written answers and post those. Um, because uh, there's a, still a lot yes. of good questions, sure. uh, and I want to yeah. honor the time frame. Um, sure. So. All of our speakers have agreed to answer all of the unanswered questions, so we'll make sure that that happens for everyone. After, after milking, right? That's right. <laughs> exactly. And hay cutting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining us today. This has been a great discussion and proof that there's wonderful resources out there, both written and um, people that have experience to share on uh, anaerobic digestion at farms. And uh, we will be posting the recording and the presentations on both NERC's and NOAA's website. But I thank the speakers. I thank NUMOA for partnering with NERC. I thank all of you uh, who stayed with us for the full time. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the information that was shared today. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to our presenters. This was great.